Do I need to move anywhere? Move You're all good. Here? You're all good there. All good. So welcome. Look at the camera all Hi. the time. Hello, hello. Is um, on? Are we on? Yeah, we're on. All right, we are live. Um, Happy days. So, see, in this van, I have an author. I have an author in this van today. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> an author. Wrote her own book. Um, I'm delighted to have Rachel Kiao with us today. Um, delighted to be here. This is going to be some conversation. Really. We're really going swimming. We're, we're going deep swimming. We're going deep swimming. We're going. Yeah. We're going into that cave. Oh into God, that God, dark God love cave. you. God love you. <laughs> You'll need to sleep after it. I, I need always. to sleep. Give Rachel. Um, make yourself a cup of tea at the moment. This is going to be a good one. Uh, make yourself a cup of coffee. Give Rachel the real Rachel Kyo. The real Rachel Kyo. On Instagram, give her a follow. Again, you've heard me harping on before about creatives, about people that are into art. These are the people I'm drawn to. I'm interested in. Always was, but I, I, uh, I want to speak to these people. I want to find out stuff about them. So. Because you're like that as well. Book look, yeah, no, that's because I'm like that. I'm turn that off. Like attracts like. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. So we're in the shack. We're in, we're in the, we're in the van chats. So Rachel, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Ballymun. Okay. In the house of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And I lived there till I was about eighteen, and then I became a bit of a gypsy. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, my mother, she was only she's only a kid herself, like when she had me, you know, she was only fourteen okay. at the time. Um and there was a, a huge shame attached to that back yeah. then, you know. Yeah. Um and then there was my nanny my granda. Um my granda was a butcher. Okay. Right? Big hardy outfle. Okay. Um, and then I lived with my aunties um, and my, my two uncles and they were all really young like so when I was growing up it was like if they were my brothers and sisters you yes. know um, <clears throat> and uh, we used to always kind of joke well my family used to always joke years ago saying that like we were, they were the only ones in Ballymun that had Barbies with four coats yeah. because my granddad would come home you know with the big huge like you know the, like what you call it, the pig's head and everything yeah. and the cock whites and all sorts of stuff <laughs> But um, like we never really wanted for anything, you know. Yes. Um, my nanny worked in the airport. She was every day out working. Um, so, you know, I, you know the way you hear about a lot. Of, you know, there was a lot of poverty in Ballymun and stuff like that. But I suppose for my family, um, because they worked, I never really wanted for anything in particular. Mm. You know. Mm. Um, but my granda was a heavy drinker. Okay. You know. Um, so. And he wasn't, when, when my ma got pregnant, he freaked out. There was okay. killings over it, like, um, and uh, my my nanny and my mother had to leave the house, like, for a certain period of time. And I'll get into that a bit later on, yeah, why yeah, that yeah. happened and all yeah. that. Because it's all kind of connected to the stuff that I'm doing now, you know? Yes. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so my mom really struggled with that, do you know, that she was so young. I mean, she wasn't even developed herself, like, yeah, at yeah. the time, you know? <laughs> Um, and she was going out with my dad. My dad was 18. He okay. was a good bit older, okay. you know. Um, and they were together for about two years and then they broke up and I didn't see him then. I actually thought he was dead, John. Okay. Um, until I was about 11 or 12. Okay. Right? And it was real Irish, like, do you know what I mean? Like, my nanny said to me one day, I found a picture, actually, of me being christened. And um, I was sitting in the sitting room with my nanny and I was like, who's that? Who's, who's that holding me? And she says, that's your father. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, and where is he? Like, And she said, um, I, he, he died. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, she just thought that was a great idea. Yeah, to yeah. <laughs> Kids are stupid. They won't know. Yeah, just yeah, say he's yeah. dead. Like, yeah. don't, don't think anything of yeah, it. No yeah. questions asked. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, And she said, yeah, he died in a car crash. You yeah. know? So I think I was about seven when that happened. Um, So I taught that, like, my whole life growing up. You know, um, and then around the same time, then my mom met my stepdad, um, and I had already started to go to school at Buddy Mun. I had all my friends. I was kind of settled. I was there with you know my aunties and my uncles and stuff, 
and the plan was was that my mum was going to move out get a place with Mick um, and then I was going to go and live with them that was the plan do you know yeah. but it, it didn't kind of pan out that way in the end um, <clears throat> and I was always great in school very academic real kind of quiet type yeah. you know mad into art um, yeah just a normal kid basically you know um, but I suppose no one would have ever thought in a million years that I'd end up going down the road that I went down yes ever you mm. know um, and uh, yeah I mean I was only about 11 and I you know obviously I was I'm from Sandy Hill and we used to call it the, po- the posh part of yeah. anyone right yeah. and um, because it's like the old houses you know but you'd walk out and like obviously the blocks were kind of all around me and everything and uh I mean, as you know, Ballymun was so densely populated, just mm. people all over the place. Absolute salt of the earth, like, mm. you know. But there was a lot of drugs, like. No you know? services, no houses, but no proper infrastructure for people, you know. It, it was a ghetto. Yeah, yeah. You know, it yeah. really was. It was just like boxes upon mm. boxes upon boxes, you know. Mm. Um, but the flats were great, like. Mm. They were fantastic. Everybody, I mean, they, they, they were... I mean, you know, like people would, they were scorching the heat and the, the, mm. the, the heating system and everything was deadly. People would like do their washing and put their, their clothes on the ground, like yeah, to dry yeah. them, you know. Yeah. And um, they were huge, like as well, you know. Mm. Um, they were very well made at mm. the time, do you mm. know. Um, but people were kind of just left to live in shit, basically, John, is what happened, you know. Yeah. They took a lot of people from the tenements in town and moved them out to Ballymun, yeah. and they kind of just left them there. Yeah. They didn't put any money into it. They didn't follow up with proper amenities or anything like that, you know. Yeah. Um, the education, you know, wasn't great, you know. Yeah. And look, I think, you know, if you have, like, um, you know, flats like that, you're, you're, you're kind of asking for trouble, mm. do you know. Mm. Um, it's just too, too many people on top of each other you know yeah. and um you know that saying you know the saying when poverty comes in 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 the door love goes out the window yeah i genuinely believe that do you yeah. know and i i witnessed it out in ballymun you know if you leave people living in in environments like that um you know people will turn to to drink and they'll turn to drugs to try and cope with it yeah do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think that's what happened. No, but everyone, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people out in Ballymun that never done anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? I'm yeah. not trying to tire everyone with the same brush. Like. No. Um, but there was a lot of it, and I suppose I kind of was exposed to that. And back then, I think um, it, it was mainly kind of just hash. Like, the likes of heroin or whatever, it was only, well, it c- kind of came into the country around the 70s, like, mm. you know, um, with the Duns and stuff yeah. like that. Um, but it wasn't that widespread yeah. at the time. Um, <clears throat> like, I used to, you know, be hanging around with the lads and the, the girls and the blocks and everything. And we're all, it was just really innocent stuff, like, you yeah. know. Um, and, like, I kind of started smoking first and it was all just a bit of crack, like, you know. Um, and then, um, you know, then we started smoking a bit of weed, you know. Um, and I remember, like, we used to go over to the shopping centres and you'd see like the men and the women who'd, who'd already started to take drugs at that point and yeah. they were taking heroin and stuff and um, I remember like we, we'd be like slagging them and everything do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean and kind of looking down our noses yeah. at them and going you know yeah. like scumbags like, yeah, yeah. On, honestly that's the way we yeah. used to look at them like yeah. you know um, so yeah, yeah. But y- even with addicts we we see and you see a group of addicts and yeah. we see addicts then within that group of addicts they're looking at their mates going jeez he's bollocks you know what i mean yeah they're, internally they're looking at each other going jesus he's bollocks i'd hate to be like him yeah and his mate is looking at him going fucking whack as fuck there as well do you know what i mean so yeah. it's mm-hmm. all this us looking down and they're looking down on each other as well with yeah. their appearance and stuff, you know. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, yeah, you know, there is a lot of that. It's, like, it's, it's, because what happens is, is that I suppose when you're in that environment, you you, you, you know, you throw a lot of drugs into the mix, you do become kind of, you become blinded. Yes. To yourself. Numb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you become numb, like, yeah. you know. And then there's always the, the thing of kind of, you know, trying to justify it. Do you know, mm-hmm. so you see, I, I mean, I've seen it and I've done it myself even re- in recovery, you know, mm. where you kind of, don't ask me how I did because I was fairly I was bad mm-hmm. do you know but even at that 
mm. because usually the the drug user is the is the last person to realize that they have an actual problem because yeah. that's the nature of addiction like yes. you know um but you're always kind of comparing yourself to other people you yeah. know in early days i suppose of when you're trying you're trying to become drug free yeah. you're look listening to other people's stories and saying i'm not that bad yeah i'm grand, yeah. I'm grand sure. yeah do you know what i mean yeah um i so could go yeah. to work i yeah. have a house i have a car um, it's the only disease in the world that whispers into your ear. You yeah, haven't, you haven't got, got it. a disease. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the nature of it, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was all very, very innocent at the time, you know. Um, and I, you know, just started smoking hash, and um, I don't know when I kind of compare myself to the people that I was hanging around with at the time. You know, we were myself and my friend uh, that from Sandy Hill. We start going over to the blocks and we were hanging around with the lads. And I swear to God, we used we thought they were gurriers, like mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And um, but anyway, we got to know them and they were they were sound, like you know. And um, but in the beginning, we we're like, oh my God, you're smoking weed or whatever. But we still didn't really think anything of it. Yeah. And we start smoking weed. And people often kind of say to me, you know, do you think weed is a gateway drug? Do you know? Mm-hmm. Um, at this point in my life, I I don't know because things yeah. are much better and we have a lot more awareness about yeah. stuff and. But back then, because there wasn't a lot of awareness, you know, or yeah. supports or even talk about it, you know, it was just yeah. so easy to kind of slip into it, you know. Yeah. You didn't really have anything to kind of go off, you know. Mm. Um, but when I think about my friends and the, the personalities that they had, like they were really outgoing and stuff, I yeah. was so shy. I was painfully shy, yeah. you know. And I did find that when I when I smoked weed, I was able to, I was less inhibited. I was able to command myself and kind of have a bit more fun, you know. Mm. Um, and the like you know the progression for me was rapid it mm. happened really really quick like you know mm. um, so I kind of went from um, smoking weed to taking E you know yeah. um, and so I was 11 when I started smoking weed okay um, and then by the time I was 13 I was smoking heroin and it was okay. like it just happened like that yeah yeah do you know but I remember when I started taking eight we used to went up to the, the back fields of Ballymun up to the place called the pavilion right? yeah and um, no, when I say the back fields like I mean you'd be black with the dirt yeah, <laughs> right yeah. like muck all over you and everything um, but it was like I mean I would just be so lit up about it you yes. know I just would literally live for the weekend yeah. you know um, and I started doing it and I remember um, seeing somebody sitting at the back of the pavilion and they were sitting there like have, you know having a smoke of heroin like and um, I was like what is, what's that he's smoking yeah. and someone said to me it's hash oil yeah, that yeah. he's smoking okay do you know yeah. um, but anyway like I obviously found out it wasn't hash oil yeah. but it was what I you know I I was seeing it around me, you know, mm-hmm. that way, and 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 the you know the person that was smoking, I ended up in a relationship with them, okay. <laughs> as you do, like yeah, <laughs> as you do, yeah, you know, yeah. um, and uh, yeah, I ended up kind of taking or having a smoke of heroin to come down off the e, yeah, and I do remember having like a fleeting thought where I was like, if you actually, you know, if you like this as much as you like e, you're in trouble, yeah. but as quick as that thought came into my head, it was gone as quick. Yes. Do you know? Mm. And I just kind of fobbed it off and I was like, no, I'm I'm mm. not tick. Yeah. I'm not a tick. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to end up like those heads in the shopping centre. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, if I want to stop, I can stop. Like, yeah. you know, and that was my kind of mentality at the time. Um, and um, obviously I didn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> obviously I went on for years, for yeah. over a decade after that. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I started smoking heroin. And then by the time I was 15, I was injecting. Yeah. You know, mm. and I was like, I was kind of gone bye bye at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, mm. um, and the difference in m- my behaviour, you know, and my my personality, um, was just phenomenal. Mm. Do you know, the people that I first started hanging around with, they obviously started to cop. Yeah. You know, and um, I remember one of them saying to me, "We were, we seem remember seeing it." like a I don't know a big fancy car going past the blocks one of the days and I was like oh that, that'll be me in a few years just messing and like they, we were messers like yeah. and your man looks at me like dead serious and he says no Rachel that won't be you he says you're heading you're like heading down a bad road you're heading yeah. for trouble yeah. and I was so offended like I was like yeah. what what do you mean yeah. do you know but he knew like he he, he seen it coming he knew yeah. what was ahead you know yeah. but I couldn't mm. believe it no. and when that happened I, I ended up kind of moving away from all them yeah, because they're know. not telling you what you want to hear. Yeah, exactly. I didn't <laughs> want to hear that, like, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and um, 
so by the time I was 15 I, I was in big big trouble you know mm. um, and I started to kind of take stuff from the house then you know to feed the habit and um, my family started to kind of cop stuff going missing um, you know I, at that point I'd already been expelled from school you know I'd start mitching when I was like 13 or whatever um, and my family did cop on fairly sharpish like you know um, <clears throat> and they didn't know what to do hadn't a mm. clue didn't know experience of addiction or anything um, but they did end up bringing me into Trinity Court okay. right and um, they said to my family at the time uh, that I was too young to be recognised as a drug addict okay. right that'll tell you what we knew back then yeah yeah you know and st- and still even today like we know a lot more but yeah. like the idea of this gateway drug like you spoke about it there a minute yeah. ago and I, I've exposed myself to all this and read and read and read like yeah. the idea what is a gateway is pain hurt shame yeah. That's the gateway. Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Hash is not a gateway. Mm-hmm. Drink is not a gateway. Yeah. It's like you can line up heroin in a classroom of a hundred people. Yeah. Probably ninety five percent of us gonna go, That's not for me. Yeah. Whereas the hurt ones, the ones in pain, yeah. the ones full of shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're gonna Absolutely. jump right in, you know. Yeah. That's the gate that's the real gateway. Absolutely. And it's yeah. something that I've kind of really tried to highlight and hone in on, mm-hmm. you know, um since you know, um, 2006, mm. I've really tried to emphasise that, you know, there's so many different types of drug users, mm. you know, mm-hmm. um, and I've seen it. Mm. I've seen drug users, right, who would be probably from around when I first started taking drugs and they start taking drugs in the same way that I took drugs. Yeah. They done the stuff that I done and they, and they looked the way I did when we were using drugs, right? But when they, got, you know, got an opportunity to become drug free, they they kind of bounced up much quicker than I did, yeah. right? Yeah. And you know, and they wouldn't have relapsed the amount of times that I relapsed. Like, and I used to be kind of scratching my head, going like, why, why yeah. can't, why am not, I not able to do this? What's the difference between me and you? Yeah. Do you know? Um, and I do think that does play a big part in it. Is your your makeup? Yes. Plays a big part in it. Yeah, yeah. Your biology. Mm. Do you know? Mm. If you have like um, if you have you know a history or you know like in your family or whatever mm-hmm. of alcoholism and addiction I definitely think that it's mm. a real thing in your genes it's going to mm. pass on to you mm. that does make a difference or determines what way you're going to go yeah. in addiction and also in recovery as well you yeah. know um, I, I think that's a huge part that's really overlooked like you know yeah. is the, 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 the bio- biology yeah. aspect of it you know um, and and your environment then as well you know if you're coming from a family that's fractured in any way yeah. you know yeah. if there's any kind of um, trauma in the family mm. you know that's trauma is huge massive you know massive um, so yeah I, I and it you know it's it took me a long time to really kind of wrap my head around all that stuff but it's kind of given me a, a, a real um, compassion of you towards other people that are using drugs you know or, mm-hmm. or who kind of would come into recovery and, and can sustain it yeah. and keep relapsing yeah. there are the people that I've always tried to reach and you know try and kind of um, like I suppose not speak on behalf of but because I was one of those people yeah yeah do you know what I mean yeah but, um, fight that corner yeah yeah, yeah mm-hmm. you know because mm-hmm. it is a real thing the drugs are a solution mm-hmm. to to the much pain. deeper problems yeah, yeah. yeah to the pain you know um, mm. and it, it is a real thing like and mm. sometimes you know I mean um, like I tried loads of different things to, to try and deal with much deeper stuff like or to even figure out what is the deeper stuff like mm. you know um, I've done so much work like different types of therapy client centre therapy cognitive be- you know behavioural therapy um, you know uh, gestalt um, all sorts like yeah went all around the world to different places you know got into all sorts of different you know med- like meditation practices and different types of spirituality um i went to lock derg for the weekend and fasted for the whole weekend yeah. and everything i got left on an island in in in, in the arsehole of the atlantic ocean and everything like mad stuff do you yeah, know what yeah. i mean like literally tried everything and i could never get and stay like you know drug free you just yeah. couldn't do it yeah. and um, it's crippling it's mm-hmm. crippling and you're kind of always going what is wrong with me mm-hmm. do you know mm-hmm. um, but thankfully you know I uh, I suppose I had good people around me do you know I like my family my family were my nanny in particular was amazing do you know she never seen me as a junkie 
Yes. You know, I hate that word in there. I'm only just saying yeah, that yeah, word yeah. because that's the way, you know, yeah. people would say it back then. Yeah. But um, she would she never seen me like that. She always just seen me as Rachel's not well. Yeah. Rachel's sick, like, yeah. you know. And thank God for that, yeah. you know. Um, but then I had my uncle, who was the complete opposite. And my uncle is seven years older than me. He's more like my brother. Yeah. Um, and he had a much kind of a tougher approach. But yeah. I needed that as well. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, thankfully for that, I suppose, was what kind of helped me to keep going in it, you know, mm. to, to, to keep trying. And eventually then, you know, I did realise that, you're, you know, when it comes to trauma, you know, you can do all the work in the world that you want to do, right? Yeah. And, and it's all really beneficial. And you will learn a lot about yourself and everything, right? But sometimes with trauma, it just takes time. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It really does. Like, trauma is not something that you can you can really manage mm. as such, mm. you know? I mean, there is stuff that you can kind of help, right? So with trauma, it's, it, it's, it's in your body. You feel mm. it in your body, right? Mm. Now, because I was... Um, on drugs for such a long period of time right and because of the you know the situations that I ended up in right so there was stuff before I took the drugs and then I took the drugs and when you're on drugs you end up in situations that obviously that you wouldn't normally end up in you end up with people that you wouldn't normally end up with you end up doing stuff that for me was completely against my own will right people places and things people places and things Yeah, yeah. yeah But it's a real thing. Sometimes that's kind of thrown around so much that you mm. kind of lose, uh, you know, the yeah. enormity of it and the effect that it has on you as a human. You know, mm. how how, the, the, how degrading it is mm-hmm. to yourself, like, mm. you know, and, and the impact that it has, you know. Um, and then yeah. that brings up more shame or more trauma. It's like a spinning wheel. Yeah. Which is just like a little snowball. And the more it gets rolled, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's so overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, it, it does have an impact on your psyche, on your spirit, you know. Um, it, it actually stunts your growth, you know. Um, and it's like, I think when I came into recovery in 2006, you know, I had a load of spells in between that. Right? Yeah. But when I came into recovery in 2006, I was like a lunatic, John. Mm. I'm not joking, you know. I was like literally guns blazing, mm. you know, mm. running around like a headless, chi- <laughs> like yeah, a headless yeah. chicken. Yeah. And it took a good eight years, I'd say, for me to pan out. Yeah. And a lot of work like in between that, right? Yeah. And um, obviously, you know, I spoke about it before. I done initially done a, a lot of NA, you know, yeah. and then I went down and I was doing a lot of um, AA and a lot of CA. Okay. And um, and there was a point like where I was quite militant about it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like I was like a Nazi. Okay. Right. Yeah. But it was all it was all fear driven mm-hmm. stuff, yeah. you know. And um, you know, I had loads of different sponsors and all that kind of stuff, and I was sponsoring other people and all, and um, doing things that, as far as I was concerned, by by the book and to the, to a T, right. Mm. Um, and I think about eight years into recovery the shit really hit the fan for me yeah. because I it took that length of time for me to tie out yeah. and then everything hit me and yeah. I was like oh my god mm. that that actually happened like yeah. Y- yeah. Y- you done those things mm-hmm. do you know mm-hmm. to your family to mm-hmm. this and I, I didn't know how to cope with it like mm. you know um, you know because like obviously you know with, with recovery and with the say with the 12 step program you know it's uh, you know about making amends you know okay. mending bridges and healing and all that kind of stuff like and I was just so naive do you know that way like you know you'd kind of be going you'd write your whole list of people that you'd harmed okay big list of people right and you'd go off and you try and say sorry you know and it took me a long time to realise like that sorry is just a word you know yeah. you know yeah. and as much as I understand or have some kind of an understanding of addiction it doesn't matter that you weren't well yeah, yeah. right yeah. it doesn't matter if you hurt somebody else yeah. if you damage or you know rob someone else or anything like that you know just you have to take responsibility for it mm. you know and like be accountable and it's not sometimes it's not enough just to say sorry yeah, you yeah. have to actually show that you're sorry mm. and sometimes that takes time and you have to be right in yourself as well you have to your own motives have to be very clear mm. you know um, so it took a long time for, for that to kind of sink in with me um, but yeah and th- so I was about 8 or 9 years 10 years um, in recovery and I relapsed again right. gone bye bye yeah yeah day day yeah mad fuck. you know after all that yeah gone yeah. again fuck and um, that was about 5 years ago 
okay. right? And I'm not joking you. I no more wanted to come back into recovery than fly to the moon. Yeah. I just I was just so tired at yeah, that point. Yeah, yeah. And I had tried I tried everything. Yeah. And I was like, I actually cannot do this again. Yeah, I can't yeah. do it. I found the f- I'd say the first eight years of my recovery to be, t- and I I I'd be very slow to say this right as well, because I never want to freak people out who are trying to become you know come into recovery. Yeah. Because I know how scary that can be, right? Yeah. But I personally did find a, a minefield. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I really really struggled with it. I mm. I, I you know um. It was torturous, <laughs> yeah. but because I hadn't got the drugs, yeah, do you know I didn't have that there. Mm. And my family were delighted. Yeah, yeah. I was obviously I was delighted that yeah. you know it was an achievement and all that, but I'd no peace. I'd no peace, like, and um. So when I relapsed, um, I had somebody. Ca- I wouldn't go back into treatment. Okay. I wouldn't do. It. I was like, no, no, I can't do it. You know, and I had. A few people that actually came over and they took turns to sit with me. And the last time when I relapsed now, it was like, it was only for like three months. But when I came out, I felt like I was gone for about a year. I couldn't believe that it was only three months. Yeah. Because I deteriorated. You genuinely do pick up from where you left off. I've, I've heard that. I've yeah. heard that. It's, you know? it's fucking balls to the wall. Like it's <laughs> fucking a million times worse than <laughs> yeah, <it really laughs> is it. before. I've heard that or people yeah. say that. Yeah, you really you pick up from where you left off, and uh, I mean, I was bad where I left off mm. beforehand, um, and um, within the space of three months, like I'd literally know I I had hair on my body. I was that thin. I was that malnourished, you know, um, and I ended up on crack, <clears throat> which I'd never done before. Okay. Um, and I was it was like scary because I'm you know like heroin is literally like skittles compared to crack. Yeah. You know, and um, so anyway, I had people come over and they sat with me. Um, for six months and I, I ended up detoxing and I slowly started to get back into the stuff that had worked for me before which was like meditation and stuff you know just simple things like um, but I kind of realised I was like this time round the difference for me a lot of the you know anxiety the depression you know all of that kind of stuff that came with recovery the last time you know a lot of it has fallen away from me now this time right but I ended up I made a decision to kind of move away from the whole recovery thing and everything that I had tried beforehand okay you know it was a personal decision for me that I had to do because I felt like I was I felt like I was regurgitating yeah yeah it was just a recognition for myself that I did have a lot of trauma yeah yeah right yeah and the more I kind of spoke about it yeah. I was wobbled in myself like yeah. you know um, so I made a decision to kind of move away and I've been very quiet over the last three years or yeah. you know uh, you know um, because I feel like that you know if you're regurgitating all the time y- your past and your history you're not giving yourself a chance to heal and you're, you're stuck in the past yeah if I keep talking about what happened like that dog nearly bite me 20 <laughs> years ago you know what I yeah. mean that's where I'll stay yeah Whereas it, it's yeah acknowledging it yeah. that happened speaking yeah. with a therapist or a spiritual advisor or whoever yeah a safe person yeah yeah talking and fucking living there yeah. instead of re-traumatising myself over and over and over and yeah. over you know even like I found look at John I have a lot of friends a lot of my friends are you know they to do the you know the programme they go to meetings or whatever and and they're fantastic mm. you know i like really good people and they live great lives and I've the yeah. respect for them so when I talk about this stuff I'm just speaking for me personally yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a personal choice that yeah. I was like I found even when I was kind of going into those environments I was very overwhelmed yeah. and I didn't understand why but then I realised I was like you're, you're really traumatised here Yes. and the thing about it is is that it was because I'd seen so many other people as well right who were like me mm. right and they'd come to me and they'd say Rachel I'm after doing all of that stuff right and I keep relapsing all the time. Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. What are they talking about? Mm-hmm. You know? So that's why I kind of I realised there is different types of drug users. Yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. And um, nobody has monopoly no. on what works. No, no, no. Th- there's no right or wrong. No. You know? It's no. it's it's finding whatever is right for you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I suppose for me, I made a decision that I just had to be quiet. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And as we spoke on the way out here, like everyone's journey. Yeah. It's, it's like months, it's baby steps. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Some yeah. people are making leaps and it's not race. Yeah. It's not race like. Definitely not, no. no. It's not and it's race. not about time either. No. You know? Yeah. Like I know people who were in, in recovery. Mm. Donkey's ears, yeah. and they're absolutely batshit crazy. Yeah, yeah. And I and I have been that way myself. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. it's about you know. I suppose, in like I, I was saying to you beforehand, my New Year's resolution in two thousand and eighteen was that I was going to completely shut down shop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that I wasn't going to be as accessible. Do you yeah. know that way? And that I wasn't going to. I just kind of stopped talking. Yes. Right. Because. It was like I just needed to be quiet and, and to settle down and be a little bit still. Yeah. And um, that was monumental for me. Yeah. Right? To, to do that yeah, for yeah. myself. That was like a gift to myself. Yeah. To slow down and just be quiet. Yeah. And I'm not joking you. Like, and listen. Just listen, like, mm-hmm. to your body. Mm. And, you know, and to try and be mindful. And, you know, tr- like, the mindfulness is great when it comes to trauma and just being aware of your surroundings and mm. stuff like that, you know. Mm. Um, but just kind of, because I had, I took on board what people said to me before over the years, you know. And it, as I said, it did help me get from, from A to B. But there were certain things, like, you know, that I actually knew that I ne- I needed to do. And I just never had the courage to do them. Yeah. You know, like even not being in a relationship, say. Do you know what I mean? People always say, you've been to recovery, don't get into a relationship. I got straight into a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> I was in a relationship the whole time. Yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. And yeah. that was something that I needed to do. So um, I, you know, got over it. I've been, you know, single for five, for four, nearly five years. Yeah. Best thing I could have done for myself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, um, and just tried to do what was right for me, yeah. you know? Yeah. And the freedom in it, you know, it's, it's, I've, um, I'm so much better now, you know, mm-hmm. because I think, right, that sometimes you're so afraid, like, that you're going to relapse or whatever, that fear can blind you, do mm-hmm. you know, and if you're focused on something, it's like my nanny, right, she fell, she, she fell a few years ago, and ever since then, she keeps thinking she's going to fall, mm-hmm. so she's focused on her feet all the time, yeah. right, and she just keeps falling. Yeah, yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So if you're, you know, fear, if you're focused on something that you're afraid of, it just gets bigger. Yes. Yeah. And it robs you then. Yeah, of yeah. Of other yeah. opportunities, like, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it was stuff like that, like, you know, stuff that I kind of learned over the years, you know, but I wasn't actually putting it into action for myself, like, and, and, and I suppose that was it for me, was just to kind of settle down and be quiet, you know. Mm. So this is the first time I've actually spoken with yourself now it's the first time in years that I've spoken you know yeah, about any of it and w- w- what you talk about like my my fear is and what I see what irritates me we were talking about this earlier on about yeah. other people yeah. if this person X is irritating me or if I'm looking at their life going Jesus Christ what you spoke about that like uh, street angel and house devil yeah yeah that's a fear of mine yeah, it's yeah. to be that way because I know loads of them. You yeah. know what I mean? That everyone on the street, he goes to mass and he's a great <laughs> fella and the whole lot, and he's fucking four hostages in his house. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We all know plenty of them. Yeah. He's a great man, boy at a point and blah 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 down the pub, boys points, everyone points, and his yeah. kids are fucking starving at home. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And the yeah. wife fucking robbing Peter to pay Paul. So so yeah. these people that I see out and about they are teaching me a lesson yeah. going I'm fucking real here the way yeah. you see me on the street is the way I'm in my house is the way I behave yeah. you know yeah. I might not say the right things I might not speak the right way but if you need a fucking hand or yeah. if you need a helping hand or yeah. if you need something done I will be yeah. there Yeah. you know yeah. and, and yeah. we've all to, to live it doesn't yeah. matter what you think of me and what I think of you yeah. it matters what I think of myself yeah exactly that's yeah, the important that's stuff do you know what I mean yeah. kind yeah. of what you're saying there like that yeah. these people you should be doing this and you should be doing that go fuck yeah. yourself I'm looking after myself yeah I'm trying to get sense. myself alright you know yeah absolutely yeah. you don't get away with it some people do yeah. do you know I don't yeah. personally you know mm-hmm. it's always there kind of niggling in mm-hmm. the background you know mm-hmm. so um, yeah you know it's been it's been a journey. All good though. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then the the, the tune 
the yeah. mother and baby home. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I suppose, like, like I was saying to you there about my mum, you know, getting pregnant at a young age, um, like... <clears throat> I was told for years growing up, you know, oh, your 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 mother could have very easily been put into one of those homes, you know. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it was only nineteen seventy nine, um, and there was a friend of hers, um, she was seventeen, yeah. and she ended up getting sent to one of the homes, you yeah. know. Um, so I kind of grew up listening to that, and then my granddad, he was in Dangan, yes. you know. Now that that was a big thing for me. That's kind of like the, the the main drive for me. Well, the personal drive for me being involved with the mother and baby the, with the art show. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the thing was, was that Alison O'Reilly, the girl that came to me in 2006, yeah. um, the journalist, um, who uh, she made the Sky News documentary, My Heroin Hell, with yes. me. And kind of done this fly in the wall thing where they followed me around for, for nine months and it was mm. like mad, right? Mm. Great crack. Yeah. But um. Alison um, literally went beyond the call of duty with me. And I was saying it to you earlier on, like there, you know, there is this kind of thing about journalists, you know, that they're sharks or whatever. Yeah. And I was real skeptical in the beginning. Yes. You know, of all all of them, because just on the grounds that they were journalists, you know. <clears throat> and um, at the time, there was nothing altruistic at all about me, you know, like speaking openly or publicly about all of that. Mm. Um, I just literally wanted to get into treatment, you yes. know. Um. But Alison went beyond the call of duty and that woman, like, she got into trouble and everything, like, from Sky News. They were, like, because she kind of crossed the line of work and, you know, becoming friends with me yeah. and my family. Yeah. Um, but I loved Alison for that, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, she never treated me any different, like. Yeah. She treated me like a human being. She was a compassionate person. Yeah. You she know. She really is, like, mm -hmm. you know. And a real girly's girl. Yeah. You know, she'd ring me up and we'd be ha having the chats and I'd be, like, you know, I'd be in Coon Dara. Yes. going through detox and yes. she's ringing me up telling me about her relation you know about fellas and stuff like yeah, that yeah. and I love that you yeah. know um, and we stayed really close anyway and then Alison broke the story of the tune babies in 2014 <clears throat> so you had Catherine Corliss that historian yeah. um, and like just a phenomenal woman mm. so humble yeah. do you know yeah. Um, and she, she, you know, when she had known, lots, obviously lots of people knew yeah. there was talk of the babies, you know, yeah. um, buried in the grounds like of Tune. And, um, but Catherine, she was doing research and basically just kept asking why, 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 yeah. where, where, where. Kept asking questions, you know. Yeah. Um, and eventually it came out then. She met up with um, a girl called Anna Corrigan. Anna's mother was sent to um, Tune. <clears throat> Bridget and then her two uh, brothers who have yeah she doesn't know where they are mm. um, they are suspected to be buried there you know okay. so it was Catherine and Anna <clears throat> um, together um, and then eventually it did come out that there was 796 babies that were basically thrown into a septic tank Yeah. and the, the nuns <clears throat> sorry no worries. Um, the nuns when they were leaving tomb they exhumed their colleagues who had been buried in the grounds yes but left the babies there yeah yeah do you know and yeah. not a word mentioned of them yeah and um so anyway yeah they found the babies and Alison broke the story yeah. you know and basically lifted a lid on like a, a social movement then after that you know yeah. because the outrage and the the, the the response from the public all over the world do you know yeah. that these men and women of God yeah allowed those babies to perish in the way that they did you and, know. and the state the and state. the government had it like absolutely. they're trying to hide behind <coughs> they had a huge part to play in it absolutely. they were given money they were paying these people for yeah. services done yeah. there was vaccine companies coming in vaccinating kids and testing out things yeah so they were all on the make you know 100%. what I mean exploiting these women and babies and yeah and then in other homes boys and men yeah but the state yeah. was front and centre in that. Oh, 100% mm. they were, you know. They were all connected, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, <clears throat> like, they were they were going in and having meetings and everything and in the mother and baby homes, like, you know, like people from the, you know, the county council. They knew what was going on, mm. you know, and they just turned a blind eye. But, mm. you know, there was, you know, there was, like, some of the kids, like, they died from congenial heart diseases, mm. you know, from infant ages up until toddler age. Mm. Um, sunstroke, heat mm. stroke, yeah. choking on their porridge, yeah. you know. They um, kept medication from the women, you know. Yeah. Um, like, appalling conditions they mm. lived in. 
back breaking work yeah. you know all because they they had a baby out of wedlock yeah. you know and at the time you know it was like the church and the state ran this country with an iron fist like mm. you know and that wasn't so long ago no no you know? it no. really wasn't like no. that, that kind of mentality yeah. you know that the, the, the way they treated women you know yeah. they were a disgrace to their families a disgrace to their communities and they were you know to be shunned away you yeah. know and they'd have their babies you know and a lot of them had their babies like you know just whipped off them yeah. and trafficked over to other countries like mm. in America you mm. know and they were they profited off it as well you mm. know and um, we like Alison you know has found we have proof of that Mm. you know of the uh, nuns making profits like of mm. the babies they were trafficked mm. yeah. you know so that's what happened anyway so um, that, that, that story was broken in 2014 <clears throat> and then Alison went and she wrote um, My Name is Bridget yeah. so that's about Anna Corrigan and loads of other survivors as well kind of telling their stories um, and the response was just unbelievable you yeah. know um, and what happened was was um, this girl an artist from Northern Ireland Alison Lowry um, she made a, like a, a glass dress right out of um, a, a, a technique that's like a real ancient technique called Pat de Verre okay. and she made these stunning pieces uh, called the, the collection is called Home Babies it's, it's on in Col- uh, Collins' Collins's barracks as, okay. you know um, but she responded in that way right and uh, we were like, you know, well, Alison, it's Alison's concept to stay with me thing. And she was like, we need to actually do something to, to help people to be able to express themselves yeah. with this because it's so big. Like, yeah, the people didn't know how to deal with it. You're talking about dead babies. Like, yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. Um, and then, you know, the obviously we were talking about the Magdalens, you know, they done a lot of the the leg work when it came to kind of getting the story out out to the public, you mm. know. Um, and then you know the survivors then of the homes like a lot of them still even now you know are st- they don't know where their loved ones are they don't know where their babies are mm. so you know for years now you know they've been campaigning and mm. trying to find answers um, so yeah we, we kind of put a thing out there looking for artists and um, we well Alison set up the stay with me thing initially I got involved as an artist but I had the privilege of being invited into some of the survivor groups okay. and I got to know a lot of them on a personal level and I was just so moved by the whole thing, you know, yeah. um, that I'm now I'm like pr- producing the, the show, you know, um, and we, we done a good few physical shows, but since the COVID came and stuff, we ended up having to, um, we, we made it virtual, um, which has been brilliant like you know got a really good response with it but it's basically just a, a space for people to be able to express themselves artistically you know mm. um and in in a real kind of a healing way mm. you know mm. but it's very survivor focused mm. you know and um, we have the page on instagram and um, that's kind of dedicated mainly for the art right yeah. then we have the page on youtube yeah. um where we have like survivor testimonies or real life stories from the survivors yeah. um, and then we have the Facebook page as well um, that would and be what's, what's that channel <coughs> on YouTube? it's the Stay With Me Art okay. on YouTube yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah um, I mean it's heartbreaking mm. you know it really is like uh, the trauma mm. that those women have, have suffered you know and mm. endured and you know like it's it's like they, they're not they weren't believed yeah. for years yeah. you know yeah they were treated in a way as if they were lying on top of everything that they uh, yeah. experienced, you know. Yeah. Um, so the the Commission of Inquiry report has been going on now for the last five years, you know. Yeah. Um, and they took testimonies, you know, from the survivors. Um, and they came out then in January with the, with the report, right. And to be honest, as far as I'm concerned, to me, it just seemed so kind of strategic. It, was, it felt tactical, yeah. you know, mm. because it was done at a time where people didn't have the support that they had when they weren't in lockdown. Mm. Why did they do that? Yeah, you know? yeah. Why didn't they do it beforehand yeah. when people, the survivors were able to access supports yeah. where they might be able to march, where they might be able to protest? Yeah, yeah. Do you know? Yeah, no, no, 100%. You know? And um, so, yeah, they came out and gave the apology and uh, it was just like, it was just ridiculous. Mm. You know, it was so up in the air. Um, there was no real responsibility taken mm. by the government. You know, mm. it was made out like that. Like the narrative, the 
there was so many discrepancies, mm. you know, in the report it said that there was no no um proof of abuse like mm, you know. Mm, mm. Yeah. yeah. Mad. Yeah. No proof of um, you know, women forcibly having their babies taken from them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it said that in the report, right, which was like big thousands of pages, right? Mm. But then in, in the apology their language didn't match what it said in the report, you know? Yeah. And it was very vague. You know, they were saying like like the stuff they'd say like the family's allowed you yes. know they allowed the women yeah. to go in yeah. you know yeah. um, and that society is to blame yeah you know yeah. like as if it's your fault and it's my yeah, fault yeah. like yeah. you know now and our <coughs> Irish government are just basically the same two parties for the past 100 years yeah, you know, yeah. same two parties <coughs> they were over all of this yeah and they just deflect things now even yeah. with this COVID, they've set up an effort. Now, when things start going the wrong way and people go, what? Yeah. It's Neffet's fault. So it's yeah. they always have somebody, a buffer in between them or a yeah. language to use yeah. to point somewhere by themselves. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're amazing at that. Oh, they really are. Mm. I couldn't believe it. Like, mm. I really couldn't. Um, well, I, 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 I could believe it because mm. I, you know, like I've being aware of like mm. I've always been kind of suspect <laughs> of yeah, their yeah. tactics that they'd yeah. use but um, like and th- in that yeah. area there needs to be a proper memorial a mm-hmm. proper shrine yeah. set up I, I've gone to the one in Letterfrack have you ever been down to that one? no no. so th- the one in Letterfrack is it's buried around the back yeah it's, it's like a hide and go seek champion to find this place but eventually when you find it there's a little poetry stuck up there from past survivors of letter frack yeah and there needs to be a proper shrine because these are my words that was mm. our holocaust yeah it was horrific absolutely yeah. boys from gloucester diamond and from dublin one mm. being set put on a train and then picked up at a train and mm. driven for the guts of two hours into the wilds of Connemara because yeah. they didn't go to school yeah. or you know what I mean yeah. for the, to, to be raped abused yeah. battered and, yeah. and the graveyard you're looking at all these boys five six seven eight yeah. Yeah. like he, eight year olds it's it's, it's 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 horrific like you know it's a yeah. very it's it keeps you humble yeah I've said it to people and they're like oh, I couldn't see anything like that yeah but you need to yeah, you need absolutely. to know what authority and what government left in complete control is capable of doing yeah absolutely. you know what I mean yeah. how power corrupts yeah and we were just talking about it earlier you know mm. that you know when people are in a position of power how easily that position can be abused yeah. you know and you do see it a lot like and I mean right across the board mm. I'm talking about like you know mental health services I'm talking about addic- addiction services yeah. you know and even like that you know when it co- with the uh, with the, the uh, I don't even know why they call them homes they yeah. weren't homes they were prisons yeah, do you yeah, know yeah. Um, where the most vulnerable people of our society were like abused you know mm-hmm. and um and raped and i mean even with my granda right like we you know we knew that he was sent to dangan right yeah. but we didn't talk about it yeah. and no you god forbid you ever spoke about how you felt yeah. you know in my house when we were growing up you just didn't talk you just yeah, didn't talk yeah. about anything you know yeah. um but i only found out then years later right and um, my granda was very unpredictable man yeah. you know like I but I got on with him like yeah. I I absolutely idolised him you know, mm-hmm. um I actually t- used to think he was hilarious the way yeah. he went on, <laughs> the way yeah, he went yeah. on, yeah, um but we realised then years later well I did, he came home you know when it all came out about the abuse you know uh, with the Christian brothers, yeah, so they all had to go in front of the Karanua board yeah. right. And even at that, like the the supports, they didn't have supports in place for people. They really failed to recognise the damage that they had done, even in the way that they set up that board. Yeah. Because my granddad had to go in, and he had to like tell his story, open up a wound that he never spoke about, yeah. right? Um, so that he could get redress, you know. Yeah. And the day that he done that, he came home, and I was standing in the kitchen, and he walked in, and he was lit with colour your jumper, yeah. white as a ghost, yeah. right? And I was like. Yeah, all right. And he goes, No, not really. Yeah. And I was like, What's wrong with you? And he said, 
I had to go and talk to this girl today and she was only a kid mm. about me being in Dangan. Yeah. And he says, would you believe, right, so he would go on, would you believe she started crying? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I was like, what? And he goes, she started crying. Yeah. And it's mad because I think that, you know, it's not until somebody else probably reflects back to you. Mm. What you, how you should have been yourself about mm. the situation that you realise the enormity of it, you know? Mm-hmm. And no word of a lie, my granddad took to bed after that and never got out of bed. Mm-hmm. That was it. End of story. Mm. Didn't get any any. No supports, on. no services, no counselling, no psychotherapists, no, nothing. nothing. Just well, nothing. yeah, out the door. Yeah. Next. Good luck, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that I suppose for me it is, you know, a big driving force with mm. being involved in all this, like and kinda of getting to know the women and their and their stories, you know, and mm. And I tell you what happens, right? When people have to fight that long for something like that, mm. with that amount of trauma and damage, what happens is it's the end of turning on each other and everything. Yeah, Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and it, like, you know, so they came out and they said that there's now they're saying there's nine thousand babies, you know, yeah. that died in the homes. Like yeah. that's that is, mm. as you said, that that's a holocaust, like you know. Yeah. Um, and these homes, they're crime scenes, John. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone else done that? Yeah. They'd be in like a light. Yeah. Forensics would be sent in, sent yeah. in like a light. No. You know, but no, I mean, you know, they yeah. they they they're being left there like, you know. Um and they're even with Besbra, you know, there's a whole thing about them talking about building apartments on top of Besbra now yeah. as well, you know, and there's like a suspe- 1024 babies like, you know. Yeah. Um yeah. it's just yeah. And it, you know what? <clears throat> when we were doing the stay with me thing, right, the n- not the last show, the show before that. When we put it out I couldn't get over the silence after it. Mm. I literally sobbed for, for days after it, mm. you know, because I knew people had seen it, mm. but I couldn't believe the, the level, of, level of silence, you know. Mm. And it took me a while to kind of realise, it was like, it's so close to the bone. Mm. It's so hard for people to look at it. And people do fob it off and go, ah, but you know what, it was, that was like in the 50s and the 60s, you know. Yeah. And I suppose what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to bridge the gap. From, from past to present yeah. you know and, and we're doing because it because the behaviours in government stay the same yeah when yeah. left unchecked yeah. which if yeah. you look at what's happening yeah. it's left unchecked they're just repeating yeah. the same stuff all the time yeah. but there's new words for it yeah exactly you they know just what I mean? become more clever mm. in how they deal with it mm. you know and they're just puppets on, on strings yeah. there's to me there's much bigger powerful forces yes. like behind the scenes yeah, yeah. you know that, that we don't know about yeah. no. you know um, but I mean, they came out with the apology. A lot of the survivors weren't happy with the the language that was used. Yeah. A lot of them want them to retract mm. some of it. You know, it's kind of created a split down yeah. the middle between the survivors. Yes, because some of them aren't happy with with it and they want want it changed. Yeah, but if they do that, that will delay the redress for the for the survivors that that want it now that have yeah. been waiting so long. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them. Like by the time that they do that, a lot of them will be dead. Yes, they'll be gone. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's it's a real time thing now, yeah. like you know. Yeah. But it definitely is something that people, you know, I would encourage people to look. To, I know it's very hard to look at. Yeah. You know, but it is our heritage. It's our roots. Yeah. It's our history. Yeah. You know, and no wonder. You know, we have. You know, like people over the years that have such high rates of alcoholism and mm-hmm. suicide. It's it's all connected. Like, you well, know, if, if you look at, for instance, right. The heroin problem of yeah. the early 80s, okay? Yeah. Where it really started, first of all, was Dublin 1. That Dublin yeah. 1 area, that's where it kicked yeah. off. And I remember talking to people, I'd come across people when I was working, that had been in Dangan and ha- that had been in Letterfrack. Where mm. were you from? Dublin 1. When did they get out? Mid-70s, late 70s. Yeah, yeah. When did heroin really kick off? Early 80s. Yeah. Now, what do we know now? Okay, we used to think that you walk down the road and I walk down the road and a drug dealer came up to you and said, do you want heroin? <laughs> and we said, uh, no thanks. And you said, oh yes please. And you came instantly addicted. No, yeah. that's not how it works. Yeah. How much trauma have you got on board? Yeah. How much pain have you got on board? What would you say to these people coming out of them homes with the shame, the yeah. trauma? What yeah. have they got? And then what arrived on the scene? And yeah. what helped them? Yeah. And then Absolutely. it went out to places like Ballymun and then it went and all these homes and don't call them homes, yeah. places were high walls that kept people inside. Yeah, yeah. They all got opened and, and then the sense of shame. 
if you had a grandfather there, mm-hmm. couldn't talk about his emotions, yeah. flew off the handle. Yeah. You, you're looking at this man learning. Yeah. So what are you yeah. going to do? Yeah. You're not going to be able to express yourself. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to express myself. Yeah. You know, with the hearts and everything. Yeah. That I'm looking for love and compassion and to be shown the way. But yeah. yet, he's behaving like this, so I'm going to mimic it. Yeah. And then I go out and it just keeps going on and on and on. Yeah, exactly. You yeah, know? that's it. Yeah, it's, it's no coincidence, like, you no, know. No. Really, it's all connected. And, you know? and then with methadone programs, the yeah. methadone program only got introduced because people from the north side of Dublin, Dublin 1 and these working class areas were mm-hmm. going breaking into people's houses that were in power. So it's like, yeah. okay, it's affecting us now, we have to stop it. Yeah, 100%. And, and methadone, just keep them fucking medicated yeah. and safe and our houses are grand. Yeah. Because it doesn't work. No, no. It's, it's, it kills people. It's, yeah. It doesn't, methadone doesn't work really. It yeah. keeps people suspended, doing more damage to them mm. for years and years and years. Methadone will work when we put in the right services, and you know what I mean. Yeah. But like with everything cut down and what what we're going through in COVID as well at the moment, them services are not there. Everything mm. is suffering from COVID. Absolutely. Everything. Like, absolutely. Like yeah. it's it's so much. I mean, I mean it was bad enough before COVID. Mm. Do you know? Mm. Um, I mean, my God, like you walk down Henry Street now. Yeah. I mean, it's just tent after tent after tent, yeah. isn't it? Like to see it, you know. Yeah. Um, but it was the same as well. Like when we were going through the financial crisis in two thousand and eight. Do you remember yes. that? Yeah. You know, same thing. Yeah. Like you know, all of the the people, the really vulnerable people, were literally put down at the the you know the yeah. end of the list. Like yeah. you know. Um, but even at the best of times, you know, like. I suppose when I when I you know when I first came into recovery in two thousand and six, um, and I went public about my story, it was an it was a desperation. Do you know mm. what I'm saying? My mom went to the newspapers with the pictures of my arms and stuff yes. like that. You know, yeah. um, and I genuinely I didn't really think anything of it at the time. I just wanted to get in somewhere. I just wanted yeah. to get treatment. You know, and the waiting lists were just like out the door. Yeah. You know, I think at the time. I think there was a like registered um fifteen thousand drug addicts yeah. registered, right? Um and I think there was only twenty six detox beds at the mm-hmm. time, right? Yeah. Um and I at that point now I was overdosing on a daily basis, like I was very, very bad, you know. Yeah. And my mom was living over in Lanzarote and uh at that point my family had kind of just blanked me, right? And yeah. rightly so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they were dead yeah. right, like, you know. Yeah. But um they they knew they were like it's only a matter of time before we get a phone call saying that Rachel's dead you yeah. know, um so my mom me my mom she ended up coming back because I was that bad right, and um she out of desperation went to uh, Michael Brennan he's a journalist another really nice journalist um with the uh with the Independent, and she showed him my photograph and um they put it out there right and um sure I was out of my head John I hadn't a clue what was going on you know, yeah. and um it it kind of just like you know like grew legs basically but I think it was because there were so many people out there that were in the same situations right that you know couldn't get a detox bed and who were dying on their feet basically you know and they could relate to that and like that was like a bit of a saving grace for me do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, it it didn't get me into treatment any quicker. Yeah. You know, it yeah. really didn't like. Yeah. Um, because there's so many people on the waiting list. Um, but anyway, it took I think it took about four months for me to get into treatment at the time. Um, but uh, it didn't hasn't improved like much no. since then. But I realised at the time I was kind of shocked. I was like, Jesus, like people are actually listening to you here. You have mm-hmm. a bit of a platform, mm-hmm. you know. And I always wrote, mm-hmm. you know, and I always read all throughout my addiction. Mm. You know, um, and and then I wrote Dying to Survive. Like, yes. I still came to me and asked me to tell my story, but that was after kind of um, trying to highlight the lack of you know services, the lack of facilities, the stigma attached to drug use, yeah. um, you know, trying to humanize addiction. Yeah. And I, when I wrote my book, I went down my way to not really talk about drugs, I done it on purpose. There's very, very little about drugs in my book, yeah. it's more about the mindset behind it, yeah. you know. The, the emotions behind it you know because I knew people could relate to that mm-hmm. you know yeah I everyone knew, can yeah everyone can you know yeah. um, and I suppose just trying to show the human behind the drugs you know um, but yeah like and I was like if you're going to write if you're getting an opportunity to write a book 
you need to be honest like mm -hmm. you know that was mm -hmm. a big thing for me and mm -hmm. um, but the support that I got from the public was phenomenal it yeah. really was like and the amount of people out there that are in the same situation but the stigma that's attached to it mm -hmm. and that's still attached to it even now yeah, yeah. you know yeah um yeah. but um yeah like from then up until now I mean they, they did you know they had the whole kind of uh the national drug strategy you know um but I like I was saying it to you beforehand in 2006 I had I had been in and out of prison from a very young age you know I was only 15 the first time I was put into prison right now it was against the law John yeah. back then right yeah. there's an act called the 2007 act it's a you know where um uh young offenders you know should be given like they shouldn't be sent to Mount Joy prison yes. put it that way right yeah. I should have been 17 or over yes to go in there yeah so yeah I was wild yeah could I have been helped I don't know yeah, Do you know, yeah. I don't know, John, right? Yeah. But I got one JLO and then I was sent to Mount Joy, right? Yeah. And I was put into a confined area with women that were up to 70 years of age, right? Yes. And we all, like everyone knows now at this point, you know, drugs are readily available in prison, yeah. you know? Yeah. But I was kind of around people like that were using dirty needles, yeah. you know, um, sharing needles, you know, giving me drugs, yeah. you know? I had a woman come up to me there a few years ago and uh, she, she was like, Rachel, no, I, had, I hadn't seen her in about 15 years. And she's like, Rachel, I need to talk to you. And she said, I actually gave you heroin when yeah. you were only 15. I haven't been able to sleep at night at some nights thinking about that. Yeah. And she, you know, she's doing really well now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but she's one of the lucky ones that got out, yeah, do you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that like, I don't know, I ended up in there, right? And I, the, the prison is meant to be a deterrent. Yeah. Right? Like, it, it's like anything but. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? I've always kind of felt like that you're you're actually not... The government are saying that they recognise addiction as a health issue. Yes. Right? As a sickness, an illness. Right? So, if you recognise something as an illness, why would you punish someone for that? Yes. Why? Why? Yeah. So, you clearly don't recognise it as a health issue. Yeah. You don't, like. Yeah. Again, that's just, that's just the, the language that they throw out there. Yeah. Their actions don't reflect what they're actually saying. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So, um... Like and picking up young flas, I spoke to him, not talking about the young flas, picked up for minuscule amounts of weed or whatever and yeah. bringing them back to the station, writing up charges, going to court. If we're concerned about money saving, how much yeah. is that waste of time costing us? Yeah. Like yeah. drugs need to be decriminalised in this country. Absolutely. Because we're targeting the most vulnerable. Yeah. And they're going through the system. Yeah. And people who aren't vulnerable, who are from can get a solicitor, can get a good brief, yeah. they get out of it. Yeah. And yeah. the other people don't and they get caught up in the system and they just yeah. get milled through it, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. Like John, when I wrote my book, right, it was like I, I tried not to focus on any on, on anyone else. I tried to, you know, take responsibility for my own actions and all that, right? And that's kind of part of the deal. Mm. You know, if you want to get your life together, you have to take responsibility for it regardless, yeah. right? But so I mean, when I done my new edition, I done a new edition there two years ago, and I completely changed my stance, you okay. know. And I was like, you know, I've done that. I know loads of people that have done the same thing. They took yeah. responsibility. Now the government needs to take responsibility. Yes. Do you know, yeah. they do have a part to play in this. Like, yeah. you know, they did leave people to rock, to yeah. live in shit. They didn't put the money into the areas that needed it the most. Yeah. And you still see it now, like in areas like Ballyferm, Mclaughlin, and Inglis. The lads are going around on the motorbikes. They've nothing to do. What, yeah. what, what, what do you expect them? Yeah. How else do you expect them to end up? You yeah. know, dabbling with weed or you know, yeah. I've I've nothing against weed by the way. Or, yeah, yeah. Or or like you know, I've yeah. very relaxed. I'm I'm pro. If you want to use heroin, knock yourself yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I am yeah. I am I am decriminalised. Mm. But then there's certain people. I I love. I I spoke to Philly McMahon about this and yeah. speak to Philly at length <clears throat> about this. Yeah. My brother lives in Switzerland, so Maybe. I see he, how it is on the ground there. Yeah. If we really want to tackle this. Yeah. It doesn't cost a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we can retrain people that yeah. are making vulnerable people's lives hell and retrain them to hell. <clears throat> it's, yeah. it's it's easily done. Yeah. But when we live in a country that's spent close to I think a billion on contact tracing. Yeah. For yeah. COVID nineteen. Yeah. We're locked down and it's failed and we, yeah. we seem to do things the hard way in this country. Yeah. There's no, like, streamlined thinking or... 
No. We we can't seem to adapt. It's yeah. like, oh no, we're Irish. We're, we'll make a balls of it on our own. We're not yeah. going to learn from the Swiss yeah. or learn from the Portuguese. Yeah. And it's frustrating, like, you know. It's so frustrating. Mm. Especially, like, you know, I mean, you know, when you have people that are actually dying around mm. you, like, or whatever, do you know, and you, you, you know that there is a solution to this, like, yeah. you know. It's like even with, you know, the beacon. Do you remember, no, yes. they're, like, they're sending people to, to you know, yeah. to, they're, they're sending people now to private ho- hospitals or whatever to be yeah. treated with the COVID, right? Yeah. Why couldn't they do that years ago when yeah. people were, like, elderly on yeah. trolleys for days like yeah. in hospitals yeah. it's not that they can't do it it's that, that they won't do it yeah. do you know and even with the decriminalisation thing like I was saying it to you beforehand I was essentially decriminalised by a judge named Cormac Dunn mm. you know and I suppose that's for me like that really struck me because mm. of how freeing that was for me yeah. do you know what I mean that I didn't have that I wasn't carrying that you Hanging know over into you. my future with me yeah. do you know he completely struck out all mm. my all my charges you know mm. Um, and just yeah psychologically it was so freeing um, and then I see that they were doing it in different countries you know like Portugal and um, like now there's like 30 countries around the world that have decriminalised yeah. you know or they've kind of used as like similar kind of sanctions you know yeah. um, so in so I've always been a great believer in it you know yeah. um, and I think I think it was about 2014 right the government put out a thing to, to the public right asking them what their opinion was whether or not they were in favour of altering sanctions in regards to de- decriminalisation right they got over 20,000 submissions from the public yeah. right like I, th- as far as I know all of the, the services were in favour of it like yeah. a lot of them were screaming out for it right yeah. because what would happen is right is that if you decriminalise right like what you were saying so what's happening is they're putting all the money into policing administration you know legal fees mm. um, I think it costs over 70,000 to, to house one person a year in prison yeah. and the last time I checked it was like 72 or 73 percent of the people that are in prison are in on drug related charges yeah. right so that's huge like that's yeah. a huge amount of money that's been been pumped into that right yeah. and then you have this like fantastic national drug strategy that we have with yeah. all the different pillars that they have they've done it brilliantly you know yeah. Ayanna Worden I love him yeah. brilliant yeah. Um, and Lynn Rowan absolutely yes. fantastic <clears throat> you know shout out to Lynn Rowan go on the Lynn love Lynn savage. we love her and She's I love, love Ayanna as well yeah. Um, but yeah so they have that there I mean if they reallocated the money right and actually did treat it yeah. as an illness you know yeah. and instead of pumping it into that that they put it into the prevention pillar, mm. you know, campaigns around drug awareness, mm. like for kids, yeah. put it into the areas that needed the most, where they have like music hubs or stuff for them to do, like, yeah. you know, yeah. um, put it into treatment, yeah. you know, yeah. um, like it, make more detox beds. Like for, for someone to get into detox, right? So, so you have like, say, 50 detox beds. Yeah. For someone to access one of those beds, right, you, ha- you actually have to be from a certain catchment area, first yeah. of all. So that's kind of like, it's like discrimination yeah, in ways, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and also, you have to be off, you have to be off everything bar methadone. Yeah. Now that implies like there's, there's something in the mist there, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. That implies that you have choice. Yes. Do you yeah, know what I mean? yeah, yeah. Like seriously, if you can do that, if you're able to come down off everything, yeah. onto methadone. Yeah. Well, I mean. I think you're not addicted. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, it yeah. takes it a lot but to it, get it, from there to there. But it's turned into, this is me putting my conspiracy theory hat on. It's a business. Oh, yeah, it's a huge empire. Recovery is a business now. Yeah. We're trying to get a friend <clears throat> of ours um, into Coomber. Now, yeah. if I, 20 grand, I yeah. could get him into somewhere. Yeah. I haven't got 20 grand. Yeah. To someone from Ballymun to get their son are they going mm. to have 20 grand to get them in somewhere? No. Yeah. We're trying to get him into Coom. We're He's on a list. <clears throat> yeah. He's on a list. He's, in fairness to him, he's making phone calls to try and get in there. Yeah. He's clean. But we should have these places all over them. They, yeah. They don't cost that mm. amount of money. Whereas yeah. we're not serious about it here. Mm. We're, we're just, we don't seem to be serious about addiction in this country. It's very frustrating, you know. Yeah. There's no supports, no helps. <clears throat> we we throw money at it, but I don't know where this money goes. Yeah. We've the fourth most expensive healthcare system in Europe. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um we've the sixth most expensive healthcare system in the world. Yeah. With regard to beds available, we're yeah. just above Mexico on the table of beds. So yeah. what what are we doing <coughs> wrong? 
you need to look just, inwards. When, yeah. When people are trying to fix themselves, they mm. look inwards. We yeah. seem to look outwards. The government yeah. seem to look outwards. They yeah. want, don't want to look inside and see what what the real problem is, you know? Yeah. No, there's a huge a huge disconnection with the government, you know, and they kind of, they ended up like, with the decriminalisation thing, you know, um, I, to be I, I was disgusted with Catherine Bourne. Mm. I was disgusted with her. I mm. couldn't believe it, mm. you know, um, that, you know that she kind of went along with that at the mm. end they failed to recognize the calls from the public and from the services that that's what they wanted that's what we needed yeah. we needed um like <clears throat> people kind of you know get mixed up sometimes around decriminalization yeah. like the thing about portugal when they decriminalized right initially people were afraid that like lisbon would become like a drug haven yes. because it's like oh no you're sending out a message that it's okay you know that yeah. it's okay to take drugs yeah no that's not what we're saying yeah. Do you know we're saying like that like we need to be realistic yeah you know that it is an issue it's a yeah. huge issue and there's people dying left right and center mm -hmm. you know um and to like see it for what it is you know um and not not be like pretend that it's not happening mm. do you know what i'm saying but they uh went they flew in the face of people that wanted and really needed it and they went with a diversion scheme mm. you know and it's like you know three three strikes and you're kind of out mm. which again implies that they don't understand what they're dealing with yeah because like there's going to be a lot more than three strikes exactly it'll be 10 strikes 15 strikes 50 strikes yeah, don't yeah. give up because that's the nature of mm. it you know there's always going to be the strike site because mm. You know, unless you're getting the right treatment, you know, and like even in terms of treatment, there's like there's not it's not holistic enough, mm. do you know. I mean, it's only in the last few years that you know you hear people talking about adventure therapy. Yeah. You know, which yeah. is brilliant. Yeah. Because you know, like one team might not what works for you might not work yeah, for yeah. me. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so yeah, that was that was devastating. Yeah. They made it. I think they made a big mistake that they didn't go with that. Mm. Um. At the time, but. Uh, I think with the, with this pandemic, I think people probably they will come out with more of an understanding mm. of what it means because a lot of people are you know they're drinking and drugging. Yeah. But, you yeah. know. Now I I I put up there and I I know plenty of people and I have my eyes open and yeah. when I drive by <coughs> Charlestown off license, I'm seeing queues outside Chinese takeaways and off licenses. Yeah. yeah, some people like a drink, but what we we've we've have the, the data out there and the know-how that you traumatise people, cut mm -hmm. off their sources of income, yeah. leave them worried about things. Yeah. What do they do? Yeah. Look back in history and see what they've done. Yeah. Learn from history and yeah. see what, what we've done in the past, how we've coped with that. Yeah. Okay, we take our history. We came out of mother and baby homes. We came mm -hmm. out of industrial schools. What happened? Yeah. Was life better? Did everyone learn their lesson from being an artane and off they yeah. went into the sunset? No. Yeah. They had families young. They hadn't got a whole lot of education. And mm -hmm. what they did is they re-traumatized re the next generation mm -hmm. because they were traumatized and they couldn't speak about their feelings. Yeah. It goes on and on and on yeah. and on. Absolutely. You know, and through no uh, fault of their own. Yeah. Through no fault of their own. It's, you know, if you follow the money you'll find you'll find out you know yeah. really the real answers like you know mm. and i've always said you know it is it is a class issue you know mm. when we were doing the play 100%, heroin, yeah 100 when we were doing heroin like we really tried to emphasize that you know we, we were like and dino and all came dean scurry came with yeah. us and we wrote all over the walls out of bally it was it was some crack yeah it's out, outside the, the chimneys are saying that <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah and um i i spelled heroin wrong you believe that? <laughs> yeah. Remember, remember that in, in the commitments, heroin, heroin spelt with an A on the end. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, no. If you look on the commitments, yeah. everybody had the thing. He's like, I'm not sure there's an A in heroin at the end. No, he, no way. He, 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 it was spelt like a heroin, a female hero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we were like, we were like, um, you know, it was like 10 o'clock at night or something. We, wait, we waited until it got dark. Deadly. We went out with the paint myself and Dean and Grace. And um, like it was real long. I mean, yeah, wrote, yeah. this is class genocide and economic massacre. We are the ones with the targets on our backs. Yeah. And while we were doing it, there was some man, like a security guard in the shops going, will you please refrain from painting on the wall like yeah, your yeah. own private property? Yeah. And um, he called the guards anyway, you know, but the guards, they, they were like, geez, that's great. That's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, <clears throat> we always try to kind of get that point across that it is a class issue, you know, mm. that, that they need to tackle the structural inequalities within society that, you know, 
like like what you said there you know if you have money you're able to roll into John of God's you know a few times a year yeah. you're able to jump on a plane go into treatment yeah. you're able to go into the Rutland you're able to pay 70 and grand now I was in the Rutland a few times mm. right and like the people in there are amazing people yeah, yeah? I'm not saying anything about them yeah. a couple of my friends have been in there have been over visiting them and stuff it's a great yeah. place great place well you know I personally don't agree with the amount of money that they charge to no, no. For, for someone to get into it. Yeah. And it's actually sold as a spiritual experience, you know, mm. because they're doing the Minnesota model yeah. of it's, you know, the 12 steps. It's it, You're not meant to profit off that. No. To me, you're not. No, 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 no. I just think it's wrong, you know. Yeah. I really do like and to, to, I mean, who, who can afford 17 grand for five weeks? I spoke with, with Willie White about this as well. And all this these podcasts all kind of merge and the message is the same, but... And I used to look at this program years ago and me and me mad look at this program and go, Jesus, look at them. And Willie was talking about his sister being on a queue yeah. for a living with Paddy O'Gorman. Right, yeah, yeah. So you will never come across anybody in Black Rock or Fox Rock that's mm -hmm. ever queuing for their labour. Yeah. Or queuing to get into Mount Joy to visit someone. Yeah. Or queuing to get a vaccine in the Beacon from St. Gerard's School. Yeah. But yeah. when you if you want to go and see people queuing up, go to Ballymun. Yeah. Go to Finglas. Yeah. Go to Darndale. Yeah. You see them all queuing. Yeah. So queuing is a phenomenon that just oppresses the north side or working class areas. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't Yeah. The people that can pay the money to get into the Rutland and they don't yeah. go on lists yeah. or queue. Yeah. They just pay the money and they're gone. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. we need to we need to look at this. Yeah. Why are these people more important than these people? Exactly, yeah. You know, you know I mean, and, and look, I have friends. I know people, they VH VHI and they just mm -hmm. roll into to John of God's or mm -hmm. whatever. But what happens is, is that they... And you know what? In some ways, that can be very dangerous as well because people like that tend... They can slip under the radar mm -hmm. and people don't realise how bad they are. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So it doesn't always go in their favour either, you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you're from. Yeah. You know, yeah. like with it, drugs or drink, it doesn't discriminate. No, no, it doesn't. But you're definitely mm. more susceptible if, you, if you're if you living in poverty or yeah. anything like that, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's it's normalised. It's like 20 yeah. grand for that. Sure, you got yeah. yourself into that problem. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. so we need to maybe be really serious about drugs in this country. We mm. need to really have an honest look at decriminalisation. Mm. Mm-hmm. Young Fla's picking up, as I said to you, that Young Fla picking up could pick up a charge now for a minuscule amount of weed in yeah. a grinder, yeah. which is, it's going to affect them. And yeah, then, absolutely. once you're like, oh, I've got a charge already, fuck it. I know. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And, and you would have been the same, yeah. got a charge already, fuck it. You yeah. know what I mean? You've crossed you've the line. You've crossed the line. Mm. So, so we need to look at that. And number two, we need to look at, are we really serious about helping Mm. treating addiction in this country because yeah. what I'm seeing at the moment and my life experience on with regard to friends and stuff we are not we're no, not, we're not. We, we, the minister gets up and they use all that nice language and yeah. they, they use all the nice caring language and you, you feel all warm and fuzzy <laughs> listening to them but really there's no there's no back up after it no you definitely know? not like you know, they be, they, you know, if, like if you have money, you're less inclined to rob, obviously, you know, yeah. and it, so you're less exposed to the law. Yeah. I've never seen anyone, you know, in, in Mount Joy from the middle class. No. I don't ever remember that. No. And the other thing is, is that, you know, like, I, I kind of start questioning, where are the women? Where are these women that were in prison with me? Mm -hmm. Why aren't they in recovery? Yeah. So there is a, a thing, you know, and, and statistics do show you know, it all comes hand in hand. Do you know what I'm saying? With poverty, it does breed, you know, like violence, you know, mm. and mental health issues, mm. psychiatric problems, yeah. you know, yeah. it really does. Like, and then you have all, if you have that, you're, you know, that kind of breeds, um, you know, crime and stuff. And mm. it really is a, a vicious cycle. And I think with the, the government literally just put band-aids on top of stuff mm. all the time and aren't really kind of getting to the root cause, you know. It's very hard, like, when you when you kind of see that other countries are doing it and doing so well, and you have you have friends that are kind of dropping around you or whatever, mm. and you just know it doesn't, it doesn't have to be this way. And when they came back after the whole kind of thing with the uh, decrim, what they said was, it's too complicated for us to change the leg legislation. And we're talking about legislation that, like, from haughty times, you yeah, know. Yeah. Like, change the legislation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you no, hundred percent. Anyway, yeah, that's the crack. Great podcast. 
Please give the real Rachel Kyo uh, follow on Instagram. I'm going to write. Uh, I'm going to write, read her book. I'm going to um, recommend the book for. I'm doing this challenge um, for next month. Twenty pages a day of a book. Brilliant. Everyone, listeners, Yay. get Rachel's book. We give it a read and uh, tag us in it and. But uh, it was great talking to you and myself Me and Rachel are going down to meet a few fellow uh, sea swimmers yeah, and have a chat down the beach and a uh, bit of sea air and split off home. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yep. Bye.